Today's webinar chair is Monica Granados of Creative Commons. I will now hand over to Monica and I hope you all enjoy this webinar. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much, Ruby, and thank you so much to OASPA for facilitating this webinar. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for this webinar where we're talking about the climate crisis and the climate crisis obviously is so present in so many aspects of our lives. It's in the, it's in the news. It's part of sometimes the decisions that we make in our day-to-day -day lives. And I think often we could feel like we might not have any power given the roles that we play being part of, you know, either an academic institution or a publisher or somewhere in the inner workings of the scholarly communication system. And really what I wanna say is the, the message of today is that there are many things that you being a part of the scholarly communication workflow and system can do to help address the climate crisis. I'm once again, Monica Granados. I'm an associate director at Creative Commons where I run something called the Open Climate Campaign. I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. And the Open Climate Campaign is a four year project where we're trying to make the open sharing of research outputs the norm in climate science. Because we know that as members of the open you know, community and, and scholarly communication, this is the role we can play in helping address the climate crisis. Because if we believe that if we're going to make the, if we're going to solve climate change, we need to have the knowledge about it be open. What we're doing at the Open Climate Campaign through this four-year project in collaboration with Spark and Eiffel is to open up climate change research. We want to do that by working hand-in-hand -hand with funders of research. We want to do advocacy and do these types of webinars where we talk about this message, the important work that you are doing to help address the climate crisis. We want to open past publications and we want to make sure this is an international campaign so that this is not just geolocated to areas of the world where open has been a focus. So really what are we talking about here in terms of the gravity of the problem? Well, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Vincent Larivier. He is a professor of information science at the University de, Université de Montréal. Where he holds the chair of UNESCO on open science and he serves an associate vice president planning and, communi and communications. Vincent is going to tell us about where we are in terms of the access or availability of climate change research so that we understand where we are and where we have to go. Vincent, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so so what I want to do today is basically co contrast the open access availability of uh, COVID related research as well as the as SDG research of which, of course, uh, climate action is one of the of the SDG. So, just a quick outline of what what we'll go over today. So. I'll say a few words of, about the initial reaction of publishers to the pandemic, uh, then we'll delve into the data. So what does it show? How open is research related to uh, SDGs climate change as well as research related to COVID? Then I wanna just say a few words and that's gonna be, let's say more or less a global conclusion on, on the role of preprints that are grow during the pandemic on open data and of also, one consequence of the pandemic, which is a re-emphasis on uh, national dissemination of research. And then I'll conclude with a, a few steps forward that I believe we need to take in order to make science open, but also to make, one could say, science better. Uh, so in the first couple of, let's say, weeks or months of the pandemic, very quickly, publishers and funders reacted and made a pledge that they would make both 
COVID-related data as well as COVID-related papers open. So that's a, a page from uh, the, the Welcome Trust where basically there's a commitment uh, that was signed by basically most major publishers, Elsevier, Springer, as well as uh, as well as major major funding agencies. So basically committing to making papers open, mandating data openness, and making sure that research is available. Because in order for science to progress, we need to have access to both the outcomes, the papers, as well as the data on which they are based. So very quickly, Elsevier put up a, uh, a coronavirus research hub. And so, uh, and what's interesting there is that it was always clear that this would be temporary. So that's that's how the page currently looks, uh, or basically after what's written there, after a, a year and more of access, now we're back to basically the normal, which is that paper are not as open as they, uh, they used to. Springer also uh, has made a, a web page. So basically there was a relatively positive response um, by publishers, uh, kind of making sure that that research was open. So so how does the data look like? Was it really open? Um, well, one thing before entering to the data, I just want to uh, make sure that everyone gets how many papers we are writing each year and how that has actually increased uh, during the pandemic. So, so these are historical trends on the number of papers published uh, since the 1980s. And the last couple of dots are actually our pandemic years. Um, so we've managed to increase the overall number of papers by basically about a million from pre previous years before. So more or less every year since 2020, we're collectively writing about 7 million papers, uh, of which a sizable proportion are in SDGs-ish as well as climate change areas. Now, in terms of the openness of COVID-related research, the data really shows that the community made sure that everything or a sizable proportion of the papers were available. So, so the top of the figure is, of course, 100 percent. Um, historical papers are, of course, not necessarily COVID related, but they're related to coronaviruses. So, of course, what's under, underneath that is, of course, in kind of an exponential growth in terms of numbers of papers. So basically around 80-ish percent, 80 to 90 percent of recent papers are openly available. Uh, a large proportion of those are, a, are open without a proper license, which means that they could be taken down pretty much at, at any point, and those are uh, in, in bronze open access. Now, let's contrast that to SDGs papers. What we see here is that it's roughly uh, overall a minority of papers related to SDGs that are open access, uh, except in recent years, well, let's say since about 2017, that a majority of, uh, of those papers are openly available. Uh, so that's an inter interesting contrast where we have a pandemic, which is clearly important, but let's say not necessarily threatening for the future of humanity, while you have SDGs papers of which many are elements that are actually really threatening such as climate change to the future of humanity. And those are actually not open. So there seems to be, from my point of view, some kind of inequality in the treatment of those two things. Uh, let's say a short-term emergency leads to openness and something that is a bit more long-term uh, does not lead to as much openness in terms of the, of the research, uh, of research articles. Now, if we break that down by SDG, again, still comparing that to COVID, which is on top, about 80% of COVID-related papers are were open. Now going down, down to those that are a bit more relevant to our uh, discussion here, basically climate action as well as uh, clean energy are basically the SDGs with the lowest proportion of open access, slightly above 50% in the case of climate action, action and, and under... Uh, under 50% for affordable and clean and clean energy. So again, a clear contrast between things that were, let's say, short-term emergencies and more uh, long-term emergency. Now, of course, in the scholarly publication ecosystem, there's several types of publishers. So what we wanted to do was to compare the openness of papers when they were published by major publishers versus when they were published by, let's say, the rest, 
or which includes basically small for profit as well as some independent publishers. And so we basically took Elsevier, Springer, Nature, and Wiley, which are basically the top three most active publishers, depending on the database that's used, they account between, let's say, around 35 to 50% of the overall scholarly uh, publication output. And what we see here is a clear trend in each and every SDG. Papers published by for-profit publishers were more likely to be closed than those published by other publishers. Uh, and this is particularly true for the case of climate change as well as uh, affordable and clean energy. So basically you see climate action in the case of Elsevier around 35%, 30, 35% of papers that are open in the case of Spring around 50, slightly below 50 for Wiley. And then for the rest, it's, uh, it's much more, uh, it, it's much higher. And same again for affordable and clean energy. So clear contrast, first one between COVID and SDG climate change, much more open in the case of COVID, much more close in the case of uh, climate change and SDGs. And then within those SDG papers, if they're published by for-profit publishers, much more likely to be closed than if they're published by other uh, other publishers. So that, that's, I believe, is a major issue in terms of accessibility uh, to, to, to research. So that, that's the main point that I wanted to bring in today. Now, there's a few other points that I believe are important and which are also relevant to the discussion about um, accessibility to research. In the first couple of months of the pandemic, many researchers realized that accessibility was important, but also fast accessibility was crucial. So in for both BioArchive and MedArchive, which are the preprint servers for, for medicine, we saw a huge spike in terms of the number of preprints that were submitted. Uh, unfortunately, that did not seem to continue over time. Uh, so this is something that I believe we need to still think about. Should we actually have more preprints in basically those those uh, those those relevant fields, uh, and whether we still believe that peer review is a crucial element uh, that should be there before any any dissemination? And let me recall the result of a recent study, which I find fascinating and crucial in that debate, which is how different, which shows basically how different preprints are from published versions. And basically what they found is that for about 80% of papers, and they divided those into COVID papers and non-COVID papers, and they, for about 80% of papers, there's about almost no difference. So either no real change or a rearrangement of figures. So only 20% of papers have significant content added or removed. So I think that kind of suggests that peer review, of course, those of us who review paper, we know that it typically does not substantially change the nature of, of research. So we have to think again of its role in the uh, as a filter for, for dissemination. Another element, of course, is open data, uh, which I must say <laughs> has been very disappointing. Uh, in the case of, of, of COVID. So basically looking at med archive papers that are on med archive, which is a subset of papers, but of course it's those that are more likely to be open. We saw that the minority of papers actually add their data fully open, despite the pledges that were made by publishers and, and, and funders. I'll go quickly for the sake of time. And then the last point I wanna bring is of course, in Accessibility is important, but the language in which papers are published is also important. So historic, historically, the scientific community in non-English speaking country has put many incentives to publish in English because of the prestige associated with it. Uh, we've then realized that there were adverse issues of such monolingualism. It's not available for practitioners and for basically researchers in most nations. Uh, China was one of the first countries to react to that early in the pandemic basically mandating, and that was what they did three years ago. It unfortunately did not exactly go this way, but they mandated about three years ago, publication in national journals for about a third of the papers that they funded. So they realized that they needed papers that were in their own language so that, they, uh, so that their national communities and practitioners would understand what was happening with the pandemic. So I, I do believe that this may have planted a seed for a greater multilingualism, which should again, improve availability of, of research. Um, and this is particularly true for, I believe, SDGs and um, and uh, climate change, where 
there's a strong social or social science component to that and the national communities and the people uh, need to uh, understand those papers. So quickly, a few steps forward in order to improve accessibility, but let's remember that accessibility is a function of publication practices. So we need to work on those in order to improve, I believe, research. Uh, so we need first to decouple scholarly communication, so, so dissemination from research evaluation. Uh, getting rid of journal level indicators of prestige also would also lead to more equalities, uh, equality. We need to develop new incentives. So making research open should be something that is considered as inherently positive and that is valued by our uh, research institutions. And finally, and as we've seen in the data, when it's not owned by these top publishers, it's more likely to be open. So we need to strengthen community-owned uh, means of disseminating research. So uh, thank you very much and happy to discuss more with all of you. Thank you so much, Vincent. Uh, to everyone in the audience, just a reminder, we do have the question and answer function on Zoom. Uh, it should be at the bottom of your screen. So if you have questions, pop them into the question and answer. It's just easier for us to keep track of the questions as they come in. We're gonna have a good amount of time to answer questions at the end of the presentations from our panelists. Thanks again, Vincent. Um, I have a, a bunch of questions, but uh, maybe one of them, you know, that the, a, a good transition here is, you know, you, you, Vincent really presented that we don't have the same availability of climate change research um, like we do for COVID, for example. And we actually have here today a practicing researcher. Uh, Chris Karnowskis is here with us today. He's a fellow of the Cooperative Institute for Research and Environmental Science and an associate professor of the Department of Atmospheric Science at the University of Colorado Boulder. He's an editor for AGU's Geophysical Research Letters and a section editor for PLOS Climate. We're going to hear from Chris and from his perspective, and maybe that might give us a little bit of insight as to why we're finding the patterns that we that, that we saw in Vincent's work. So I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Thanks, Monica. I'll share my screen as well. Great, are you able to see the slide? Awesome, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Monica. Um, as Monica said, um, I'm a professor of atmospheric and oceanic science uh, at the University of Colorado Boulder. This is a picture of our beautiful campus here. Um, and I'm I'm an active researcher in the physical climate sciences. Um, and I lead a little research group here consisting of students and postdocs. And um, and yeah, I'm an editor of a couple of journals that happen to be open access. Um, but I'm, I'm really here today representing myself and um, mostly going to be speaking as a researcher in the field of climate science. Um, and so I'll start with my key points up front, just in case, um, as a typical professor, I ramble too much and don't uh, cover all of them. Um, so these are my key points, and I'll, I'll just read them um, right now, and then I'm going to say a few words about each of them right after this. Um, so we're conducting a massive uncontrolled experiment with Earth's, Earth's climate right now. Um, compared to COVID-19, the pace of climate change is slower and the effects are easier to ignore. Uh, the climate crisis cannot be adequately addressed if our collective and rapidly evolving knowledge is hidden behind paywalls or if we have to email strangers to get the data. Um, the entire climate research enterprise that I'm a part of um, depends critically on open science and particularly open data, um, as Vincent was uh, speaking about a moment ago. And relatively speaking, um, it's actually a great time to be a climate science scientist. I'll elaborate on that in a minute. Um, Open data policies of journals and funding agencies are really helpful, but um, I'll show an example. Enforcement is uh, still complicated. And my, my field in particular, physical climate science, um, seems to be relatively slow to embrace open access, as I think some of Vincent's um, results just uh, showed. And in terms of open access to um, peer-reviewed research articles, uh, I think we can and must do better, and it may require some cultural changes within academia, which, again, Vincent um, very nicely alluded to. So what is this massive, uncontrolled experiment with Earth's climate right now? So 
I'm a scientist. We'll start with a little bit of science. Um, I just plotted up this um, record of carbon dioxide covering almost the last million years. Most of it comes from ice cores um, in from Antarctica that trap little air bubbles uh, that record the amount of carbon dioxide. And you can see the up and down over time. These are the glacial interglacial cycles uh, from 800,000 years ago till uh, about here. And uh, you can, what I did then was uh, appended the famous um, Keeling curve from Mauna Loa, which is, uh, you know, continuous measurements of carbon dioxide in a pristine location. And just for a little bit of context, um, in 1882, um, you can sort of see what the carbon dioxide concentration was a little bit below 300 parts per million. And that's when uh, Thomas Edison started the first U.S. commercial electrical plant, um, which lit about a square mile of lower Manhattan. Um, fast forward 100 years, that's when I was born. Uh, and around then you can see about what the how much the carbon dioxide has gone up. And then I became a dad in 2012. And what's kind of, um, I think, you know, uh, jarring about this graph, frankly, is that uh, in the last, you know, the 30 years between 82 and 2012, we brought up the, we increased the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere by the same amount that it took an, an entire century to do before that. Um, and so where are we going? Unfortunately, I have to expand the y-axis of the graph um, to show you where we might be going. Um, we talk about uh, all these acronyms, SDGs, and uh, these are SSPs, which are so, uh, shared socioeconomic pathways, which are essentially storylines of how society may unfold in the future. And long story short, there's several of them, and this is kind of the uh, bracket of ranges uh, that we may uh, see in terms of CO2 in the atmosphere uh, by, by the year 2100. And so if you just take a step back for a second and realize these like absolutely, um, you know, earth climate changing swings in CO2 that were order of mag order like 100 parts per million. Um, and then where we could be, where we've gone so far to about 420 and where we could be going if we um, go on a fossil fuel intensive pathway forward, it's, it's really something to behold um, this experiment that we're uh, conducting in a pretty uncontrolled fashion. And to sort of go with the parallel uh, with with COVID, um, you sort of think about how we all talked about and heard about on the news, how we need to flatten the curve with COVID cases. And so we sort of look at a more uh, zoom into the modern period of time with CO2 measurements, um, you know, since we started measuring them uh, in one location on top of Mauna Loa, uh, you can sort of see the curve is not flattening at all. Um, you know, this is, we've known about climate change through this entire period of time. Uh, in the late 1960s, we started developing the first climate models and then used them to make predictions in the 70s. And you can see where the Paris Climate Agreement, agreement happened in 2016. And um, obviously you can see that the actual CO2 in the atmosphere did not even flinch since then. So, um, Compared to COVID-19, um, it's it's interesting to sort of think about these curves and um, ponder a little bit, I guess, about why, um, why we seem to be not making progress on the climate problem the way that we did in terms of COVID. So I'm just putting these two graphs side by side so we can sort of see. Um, I, I just picked one sort of arbitrary climate variable, but one that probably a lot of people care about, which is sea level rise. And this is over, uh, these are satellite measurements of sea level rise uh, since the early 90s. And this is uh, global COVID deaths. And, you know, you can see that um, fortunately it, it flattened out up here. Um, this entire graph, though, over on the right-hand side with COVID deaths is actually um, just this period of time right here. So climate change is a very, uh, you know, I don't know if this is really the answer to why we haven't made progress um, or enough progress, but it's a slow burn and it is easy to look the other way and not notice the impacts as much uh, compared to when people um, around you, including loved ones are getting sick and dying. 
So, um, you know, the climate crisis, we can't, we can't really solve this. Um, if, if we have to, you know, email strangers to get data or, uh, you know, have information that's the latest, uh, science on the problem being hidden behind paywalls. And I was reminded of a nice piece that was penned by, a. A colleague of mine, um, Peter Brewer, who's a famous chemical oceanographer, but he was at the time the editor in chief of one of AGU's journals uh, called Geophysical Research uh, or Journal of Geophysical Research Oceans. And he wrote this nice opinion piece that was called Do You Expect Me to Just Give My Give Away My Data? And he um, talks about this story in here where he in 2016 he was uh, part of this group that was trying to put together a synthesis paper. Um, about something concerning climate and um, chemical oceanography. And he laments the the process of, you know, emailing these authors who wrote at the b end of their paper, if you want the data, email the corresponding author. And, you know, nobody writes back or people write back and say they're too busy or, uh, you know, can't find the data or various reasons. And in the end, he it says down here, the ugly truth is in some cases he was reduced to blowing up figures on a copier and then drawing pencil lines across the image uh, in order to actually obtain the the digit you know the actual data values from various papers that he needed to synthesize um another point i want to make is that uh climate research has for a long time um, depended critically on open science and i don't think we're doing too bad in terms of um, being able to access data uh, that's gathered by, um, you know, large scale efforts, which might be different from uh, data being shared uh, as part of publications. Um, and I would say it's it's actually a pretty fun time to be a climate scientist if you like data, because there's just an absolute wealth of data. We, we don't even have enough people to uh, wrap our minds around how we could analyze it. We have hundreds of um, Earth observing satellites orbiting the Earth, uh, taking measurements all the time. This map right here, uh, every point on the map is a location where right now there's one of these guys, which are called a, an Argo float, but basically they measure things like temperature and salinity in the ocean. So just to be clear, this isn't a map of everywhere there ever was one of these. It's literally a map of where there is one of those right now or yesterday. So it won't look too different. And there's almost 4,000 of them out there. And with the click of a button, you can download the data instantly, freely. Um, you have to have a little bit of know-how in terms of using various data formats. But um, it's just an incredible time in terms of data. We've sort of gotten um, better at uh, building portals and, and ways for scientists and, and even non-scientists to access the data. NOAA, NASA, it's usually mandated that if you use their funds to collect observations um, in the atmosphere or ocean or what have you, that it gets posted um, in a, into a repository that uh, they curate and you can um, you know sort of search for various data sets. Um, and, and speaking of uh, you know climate change and climate predictions, the same global climate models that we use uh, that sort of um, underpin the periodic assessment reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, those IPCC gigantic reports that come out, um, all of those climate model experiments can be accessed um, by scientists or really by anybody. Of course, once again, you have to have a little bit of uh, domain knowledge and data science chops to really be able to work with it. But um, it's it's pretty impressive, in my opinion, how easy it is to use these data. Uh, lots of people make an entire career out of analyzing observations or model simulations that they had no part in um, collecting or running. And uh, if you have ideas and hypotheses you want to test, it's all there for uh, scientists to use. That may be contrasted a little bit uh, with sort of the availability of data um, that uh, in terms of when a paper is published and you want the numbers from that paper, or you want the all of the uh, model outputs that went into a graph or whatever, that's a, still a little bit more complicated and um, journal by journal, uh, PI by PI, uh, and enforcement's an issue. This is just an, this is sort of just to show you how it works. If folks in the, um, there's a lot of folks on the participant list who aren't um, scientists and publishing papers and maybe nice to see what this looks like. Um, we, I just published this paper about a week ago and 
it's a good example because right there in the, um, it was in GRL and uh, it was about tropical storms and climate change. And uh, at the end, there's a data availability statement, which is required. It says where I got all my data. And then in the case of some model experiments that we ran, um, that was not just something that you can go on the internet and download. You know, we posted it to a public repository. In this case, it's called Zenodo. And it's a free uh, way to uh, openly um, deposit the relevant data from the, the models that we ran, which anybody can freely go and download. And that's the entry for Zenodo right there. Um, so these, uh, I'm just, you know, picking out uh, GRL and PLOS Climate because I'm, I happen to be an editor for those journals, but there are pretty, um, pretty well-written data policies that we have. We do, we do require you to provide the data that are um, necessary to, uh, in principle, reproduce the results. Um, again, that can sometimes be a matter of interpretation. What do you really need to reproduce the results? Is it just you want to replot it or you want to fully rerun an experiment and you need the input data? Um, but they're they're pretty comprehensive uh, in most cases. But a, as a journal editor uh, who works with journal staff who tries to screen these things, it you really it is a very time consuming effort, and it I would have to say it's probably not that hard to post something and not everything, and no one's really going to be the wiser for a little while. So I think we have a lot to think about in terms of enforcement. Um, and then, yeah, my field, and I don't know the reason, I don't know why, but my field seems to have been really relatively slow to embrace the uh, open access movement. And I thought this was kind of humorous. I uh, I have a Twitter account or X, I guess we call it now. And um, well, let's see, like a week ago, I published some, or I posted something, of some esoteric thing about why warmer oceans make the hurricane stronger. And, you know, 100 retweets, a few hundred likes, and, you know, people commented. And then I posted, hey, I'm going to be on this uh, OASPA uh, webinar. And I got two likes, and one of them was my uh, sister-in-law. So, <laughs> so, and the other one was my postdoc. So for some reason, that one's just not striking a chord. Um, and I should note that most of my followers, I believe, are probably fellow climate scientists. Some possible ideas, you know, is... Is publishing OA too expensive to authors? That's one possible reason. Um, you know, GRL, this really um, popular journal in my field before it was OA, it was kind of a bargain. It was 500 bucks to publish your paper there. Um, and when it went OA, it was uh, 2,900, which isn't out of the um, realm of what's typical. PLOS Climate is 2,100. Science Advances, which is science's open access option, is uh, about double that in nature is uh, pretty remarkable, nearly $12,000 to publish open access in nature. Um, I tend not to think that that's the main reason why, because in the physical sciences, at least our grants are pretty big and that shouldn't really be a, an issue, but um, probably more like we're still concerned with the prestige and influence, um, you know, that comes with these, um, what are traditionally non-open access journals um, you know, are we just too busy to take this up and, or do we not notice the problem since, you know, whether we know why we can access these papers or not, we just click on it here in our office. But in reality, uh, a lot of money is being exchanged, uh, in order to make that happen, you know, with the libraries at universities, uh, or perhaps, you know, we, we're just kind of in this status quo and we're looking the other way and not talking about it with each other. Uh, despite the obvious unfairness and, um, if you really think about it, exploitation of uh, the, the scientific workforce in a system that's benefiting, um, prop, you know, profiting publishers. And then my final point here, um, in terms of open access, not for, not specifically open data, but peer-reviewed research articles, we've got to do better, um, and it's going to require culture, cultural changes within academia, um, you know, uh, this was alluded to before the, you know, sort of how people get tenure, how people advance in their academic careers has been a certain way. And it's like pub largely publishing a lot of papers and uh, as many of them as possible in high, high profile journals goes a long ways and always has. Um, so we've got to be deliberate and careful and, um, you know, perhaps over time actually shift the prestige to the OA journals. 
Um, but that's going to take some real thoughtful work at the departmental level, um, because one thing I'm really cognizant of, or just, you know, sort of conscious of, uh, as someone who got tenure a few years ago, I don't want to be one of those people who uh, gets what I want. You know, I got tenure and then all of a sudden I'm be like, oh, I'm only going to publish in open access journals now, <laughs> now that I've gotten tenure. And then that's going to make it very unclear for the up and coming early career workforce who's working towards tenure, you know, so we just have to be really explicit in, in tenure expectations at the department level. Um, and so that's all I have, and I will turn it back to Monica. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chris. That was such a, a great perspective, and I can't wait to dig in a little bit more. Um, we were hoping to have uh, one more speaker today, Chris Zielinski, Zielinski, who is the president of the World Association of Medical Editors. Um, but I have some information about the project that he wanted to talk about, which is this Partners in Health Information Program. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, because I think it's a really interesting example, again, of how you can mobilize the scholarly communication community to help address the climate crisis, that there are many things that we can do to elevate the issue of not having access to climate change knowledge and the power that scholarly communication players have to change that. So actually do have his uh, slides. So I'm just gonna quickly do it this way. So here's, uh, uh, some information about um, where to contact him. So, so here's a little information about the project. Um, the UK Health Alliance for Climate Change has developed editorials to be published in multiple leading medical journals. Each of the editorials was co-authored by a high impact group of leading journal editors and other closely relevant specialists. As a project, it's not merely a communications effort, it's a real game changer. Normally, medical journals go to great lengths to ensure that the material that they publish has not appeared in other medical journals. However, in 2021, over 200 leading medical journals through the world published the editorial titled, Call for Emergency Action to Limit Global Temperature Increases, Restore Biodiversity, and Protect Health. In 2022, over 270 journals published editorial on COP27 Climate Change Conference, Urgent Action Needed for Africa and the World. And in 2023, over 150 journals published an editorial on reducing the risks of nuclear war, the role of health professionals. At the time of the anniversary of the Hiroshima explosions, the relationship there, a federal, a further editorial is planned for the end of 2023 on biodiversity. As a project that's united some of the leading journals of the Global North, the BMJ, Lancet, New England Journal of Medicine, Journal of the American Medical Association, with leading journals published around the world, including 50 African journals that published the climate change editorial that focused on the continent. They're looking to publish the next editorial. They're sending out um, uh, invitations. If you wanna be a part of it, there is Chris's contact information. I think it's a really interesting initiative. Again, kind of thinking outside of the box, thinking about like where, what's the power that scholarly communication players can, can leverage to elevate the need to have this knowledge not only open, but also to use that platform to talk about many of the things that uh, Chris talked about today um, really the urgency of the, of the climate crisis and, and helping other players be empowered to, um, to help us get to solutions. Okay, so with that, um, we have plenty of time for questions. I'll remind you uh, to pop the questions in the chat, uh, sorry, in the question and answer here. Um, I'm going to give us some time to, to put some questions in here. Um, I'm going to start uh, with uh, Vincent. I've got a, a question for you. And then if you also could just um, read out the answers in the question and answer that you've already done, since um, uh, that way we can, we can verbalize them and they can be captured in the recording. I've got a couple of questions here that I think that, that you've answered, but um, Let's um yeah 
So, so right. regarding the, so there was a question by uh, by Anna uh, about the figure comparing preprints and published versions. Whether there's actually a, some data on the papers that are not published still, uh, and of course, no, we they don't have that. So what they actually did in that study is that they found published papers. They looked at whether there was a preprint and looking at the difference. Uh, so that's of course an argument that suggests that of course there's a moderate difference for papers that get published at some point. But then peer review also serves as a filter for papers that just don't get published. That being said, analysis that were made just of the proportion of preprints that get published typically show that if you take a certain time window of a couple of years, about 80 to 90% of preprints finally find a home. Uh, so there's a relatively small proportion of, uh, of preprints that, that never get published. That being said, that's a... We don't know what the proportion of papers written that never get published, but for for researchers in the uh, in, in in this room, I do believe that at least in my case, it's the majority, and I think that's probably the case for the majority of researchers, where most of the things they write at some point gets published uh, somewhere. Yeah, I know, and thank you for uh, for pointing that out. I mean, I, I think there has been a, a slow pickup of preprints in. For example, climate change research and really anything outside of like the physics the physics realm. Um, so seeing how you know how closely they resemble that that final um, version, I think really should lend some you know robustness to the to the you know the the veracity of, of preprints or the robustness of preprints. Um, and what a good tool it can be particularly in light of things that Chris was bringing up, which many of the uh, open access article processing charges can be challenging for certain labs. Mm -hmm. And this is a way for you to, you know, make your work open, but potentially look for a venue where you can afford the article processing charge. Um, there, are, there was a question here too, um, Chris, to turn it back over to you. Um, someone asked, you know, as a society publisher, I wonder why we don't get more OA waiver requests for our fully open access journals. We make these funds available, but not all are used. That's really interesting. Thank you, Matthew, for bringing that up. Because when I go out and give talks, you know, the first thing I, I hear when I <laughs> mention open access is, of course, I think there's always the, the uh, a false uh, equivalence of OA means expensive. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but knowing that there are some waivers available, um, you answered here, I, I wondered if you could expand on this a bit. Why aren't researchers using them? I mean, I, there's, I guess there's, I can think of three reasons. The one I wrote in the chat, I'll just say, so it's captured, um, you know, it, one of the um, possibilities I brought up in my um, remarks was that um, OA can can be a little more expensive, not always, um, but in one particular case, uh, Geophysical Research Letters, which is published by AGU, which um, Matt is an informed uh, participant. He's the VP of Publications for AGU. So he knows about the um, how many um, OA waiver requests we get, I guess. But um, in that case, the price increased from what was really low to what is normal for OA, you know, just to be clear. And so um, sticker shock is probably what that is. Uh, I don't think that, but, but the fact that we're not getting that many waiver requests means we are not unable to pay. <laughs> so I don't think that the actual amount of money is a big deal, especially in physical climate sciences where our grants tend to be large enough that that kind of fee is kind of just noise. And um, another possibility is that people aren't aware despite the, you know, impressive, admirable um, information campaigns that publishers may embark on to make researchers aware of those uh, waivers. We just may not notice that or know about them. And so we're like, finding a way to pay for it one way or the other, uh, or we're embarrassed. I don't know. Maybe it's kind of embarrassing to have to mm -hmm. ask um, your society for a, a break on a couple thousand dollars when you're in a developed nation at a big research one university. That That's another possibility, I suppose. Mm 
Yeah. Yeah, no, it's great to have to to have your perspective. Yeah, I've been talking to you about that. Uh, and and just, just a few words on the on, on the, the the price points, which of course is a strong very there's strong variations by 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 discipline. So in climate change, the three thousand dollars price point is generally noise, and it's the same in medical sciences and social sciences and humanities. Though it it's kind of a big it's kind of a big problem, and 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 one of the main issues there is that the let's say the natural and medical sciences set the tone. So social sciences and humanities kind of have to adapt and, and they're unable to. Uh, so so we need something that is a bit more sustainable. I, I do believe that over, over the long term, these $3,000 per paper are, well, even right now, actually, they're, they're not sustainable, both from a disciplinary equity point of view as well from an international uh, equity point of view. We need to, to create alternatives to that. And that goes by, I believe, just regaining control over our scholarly journals. Historically, journals were owned by society. They were not making any money. Um, and basically the money that they were making, the very little was used by the community to give scholarship to students, et cetera. And now that publishing has been privatized, it's a bit more of a problem. We're paying more. The money is not staying in the family uh, and it creates inequalities. Yeah, I think that the the theme or the thread that I'm I'm hearing here is that you know there there are alternatives to uh, to to APCs. APCs can be a really good option if you're a well funded lab that has a grant where you know you can build that in. That's not the case for very many. Um, I know there's a lot of people here in the audience that come from uh, from libraries, and a couple of questions have come up about the discussion that we're having. Um, you know, uh, Laura brings up, it's unfortunate that there's not much of a discussion about green repository routes to open access, which carry no fees for authors. Um, the conversation always returns to APC Base Gold. Um, yeah, so um, Vincent will add a little bit to that, but I, I really want to bring it to, you know, this is the experience that I've also had when I go and talk about the Open Climate Campaign. You know, there's, I'll, I'll speak to researchers in climate science and ecology. And, you know, the first thing they'll say is like, I'd love to do this. I think it's a moral imperative. I think the work that I'm doing is important, but either, you know, as uh, Chris, you brought up, you know, I'm busy or it's more, it, it requires more work than just submitting, you know, one time to a, uh, you know, manuscript central, but a lot of them don't know about these other options. They don't know that like with a preprint, particularly because of a lot of the like, infrastructure around scholarly communications, you can connect a preprint with the published version using tools like Unpaywall. They don't really know about even their own institutional repositories that they can use, that librarians can help you use. Chris, could you tell me like a little bit about like, what's, what's that the sense that you get with like your colleagues in terms of like their understanding of like the different offerings of, of open access and do you think that there maybe is just like a lack of information about other routes that are available? Yeah, that was muted, sorry about that. Um, kind of, you're asking about kind of like the awareness of, of open access options. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. we don't talk, I don't hear us talking about it that much. That's the thing. Mm. So it, there's kind of this process um, that's very ad hoc. Uh, you know, you're working with some colleagues on a paper, and this is especially true on most of our work is um, collaborative. You know, we might be working with folks at different institutions or other departments within our university or whatever. Um, it's almost like an, a, a, an afterthought, oh, where should we publish this? You know, and it's rarely is there this deep thoughtful conversation going on that I that I experience it's kind of like is it a short paper then let's go high profile if it's a long paper let's mm -hmm. go with like your typical disciplinary journal that doesn't have a page limit and is just like um, a good journal like one called the journal of climate or you know and that's going to be for specialists in that field versus nature or uh, PLOS Climate or GRL, that's shorter format. I, it just isn't that much, there isn't enough of a thoughtful conversation going on among authors at the outset of like, what's our target venue to disseminate this research? 
just don't think it's yeah enough yeah and I do I do see that gap a bit you know because I you know ideally you know when you start to set up a, a, a collaborative project of course you're going to talk about the ideation and the methods and increasingly I think people are talking about data management but I think part of those conversations also needs to be about like you know, authorship and our, like you said, what do we do with the publication? Because a lot of these things can happen in parallel, right? Like you can say, look, I think, you know, this is a, you know, multi-million dollar project. We think we're, it's going to, you know, uh, it, you know, we're getting data from like multiple geographic locations. We could probably go high impact with this, but at the same time, like you can go high impact and then still think about like institutional repository options. You can still think about a preprint and those things can happen in parallel. But like you said, like, I think researchers are incentivized to think, I really don't care. I just need to, I just need to publish this. And ideally, if it's high impact, even, even better. Um, it's like not part of like the planning process. And I wonder if, you know, if that's the role for people working outside of like, that are not the scientists, but support scholarly communication, you know, is there more that can be done to educate or connect with climate researchers to tell them about this you know i've i um there's a, a tool called share your paper where basically it tells you you know whether your manuscript is you can put it into an institutional repository like you don't even have to look up the journal policies it looks it up for you and like people were mind blown they're like oh i didn't know this existed and so i mean i think that's part of the messaging for Today is, is I know, again, we have a lot of folks from uh, the, the library space here and um, academic institutions. I think we just, we need to do more connecting um, because there are incentives that researchers have and like, how do we play with those incentives? And also like, what are the means that we want to get to as like an open, like open advocates? Chris. No, I just think that's a great point. I think um, we, we focus a lot on the um, why not publish OA, you know, like it restricts the journal selection that you have to choose from, or it's more, it's a certain price point or something like that. But I think focusing on the incentives that researchers get from publishing OA, that's not talked about enough either. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to underscore that point that, um, there's incentives to publishing OA and, um, those need to be brought up. Yeah, I just think going back to my earlier point, it's like who to, who decides what journal we're going to submit a paper to? It's probably the first author, unless that first author is the student um, who's it's like part of their graduate research, then it's probably like influenced heavily by their advisor. And then I feel like those decisions are just sort of based on, well, where do where do papers of this on this subject typically go? And it's not like, oh, well, these are the open access ones and these aren't. It's just like the OA ones just haven't like permeated enough within the climate community. And I'm hoping that changes obviously, but yeah. Yeah. I almost wish there was like a graduate course that you took, you know, on publishing, you know, so yeah. it doesn't even get into like the understanding of like copyright. A lot of, yeah. a lot of researchers will also sign away their copyright, um, which, which sort of lessens the um, like power you have and control to make things open. Um, let's uh, shift gears a bit. I've got a question here from Mark, um, and I'll post this to both of you. Um, would, re would open refinable literature reviews about climate change and technologies that mitigate climate change help to accelerate research and innovation in the fields related to climate change? I think that one would be for Chris. A priori, yes, but it's uh, I'm not, not being a climate change expert. I think that's yeah. This is the one from Mark Mark G. Yeah. I mean, there are literature reviews. There's there are um, <clears throat> journals out there that are. I I hope I'm interpreting the question correctly, but there are journals out there that are specifically geared towards reviews and syntheses. I'm not sure what refinable means in this context. Uh, Monica. Yeah, I wonder Williams. actually. You know, I, I mean, I could definitely think of an example of like how that would be useful maybe in like a knowledge mobilization perspective. Um, you know, 
meta like meta analysis and reviews are really helpful um, as a as a former uh, researcher. When I'm going to start working on a new topic, that's where you start. That's where every grad student, for example, starts. You know, you you read a review because it's this like digest of, of information. So those I think are are really helpful. Um, in like when you're starting new work, I'm going to take it to, you know, like another dimension and think about like, how could we do something like that for decision makers? Um, people who, you know, it's likely that decision makers, policy makers, we understand that they're probably not going to go in and read this like primary research. Although again, speaking from my experience, I also um, used to work as a policy analyst and didn't have access actually to some of the research that I needed to then synthesize a memo that would go up to a decision maker. And then I, I couldn't read that research so it wouldn't go into the memo. So, um, but if there was, you know, a place where someone had synthesized that information, it makes it a lot easier for policy advisors to then take that information and, and mobilize it to decision makers. Like that's another level of accessibility that I think we also need to think about. Um, you know, here we're discussing having the that initial scholarly communication output be open because that first needs to be open to mo mobilize any of that knowledge. And given that, as Vincent showed, you know, we're not, you know, we're around 50% open, that we need to do that first, and then think about, you know, how we mobilize uh, that knowledge. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I think literature reviews are just incredibly helpful across all disciplines, for sure. Maybe this word refinable, uh, it means that they can be updated without having to publish a whole new, I guess that that's maybe pretty obvious in hindsight. Yeah. I don't know how that would work. Unfortunately, that's like not what we're typically doing. We'll write a big review article and then, um, you know, eight years later, just do it again. <laughs> so there's better, it's gotta be better ways to do that. Um, I'm not familiar with them, but they sound like a great idea to me. Well, I think, um, we're almost out of time here. I, I just want to synthesize a lot of the discussions that have come up in the chat really around, you know, don't forget that we have all these institutional repositories. But again, I think we also highlighted that I think a lot of the researchers who may need to make use of those repositories don't know about them. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of infrastructure out there and it's in a way a very hidden infrastructure. And I mean, maybe that is the takeaway today is that part of our responsibility working in the open space is to connect with researchers or knowledge producers who are not necessarily incentivized to go and look out, look for this infrastructure or just have a lot of other work that they're working on for us to do that work to connect with those researchers. Um, so there's a couple of references that have been put in the question and answers here. There's the open access manifesto, the spark author addendum that tackles and, and a little bit of um, rights retention as well, which is another way to make your work open. Um, it can be a complex space, right? There's a lot of things that we've talked about today. And I think more education is needed so that we can translate that information to researchers and then ultimately to boost those open access numbers in not only climate change, but our other sustainable development goals. So with that, um, maybe I'll turn it over to uh, Ruby just to sign off. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Chris.